donuts and coffee and have a great start to the day. So I'd like to introduce myself, start off. I'm Kendall Nagy. I am the director of the Meridian Anti-Drug Coalition, and I also work as the Substance Abuse Prevention Coordinator for the Meridian Police Department. And I've been serving in this position um, for about eight years now, and just love the, the work that we're able to do, um, mostly because of all the support and everyone that's coming together, not only today, but throughout the year. So it's a great honor. Um, the coalition was started back in 2004 and has been growing ever since the start. Uh, Mayor Tammy started, former Mayor Tammy started the coalition through her initiative and the partnerships, the membership, the work that we've been able to do has really expanded and flourished over the years. And so we're happy to all come together today to celebrate. We have a few special guests and of course our, our um, guest speaker today. We're gonna do um, a couple introductions and hope that you'll enjoy the morning. And um, it's great as it's recovery month to leave feeling inspired and with a sense of hope. So thank you for joining us. Too many of us know for firsthand the experiences and the impact that addiction, addiction cuts deep into our community and our families. It can leave a trail of destruction that sometimes requires help from law enforcement as well. Last year, the Meridian Police Department added a crisis intervention team and many of the calls that they respond to are the result of addiction and its impact on mental health. While everyone's path to recovery is unique, to beat the disease of addiction calls for celebration and brings us all together today. Please welcome the Meridian Chief Police, Chief of Police, Tracy Bastrochia, who will lead us in the Lord's Prayer, or if you prefer, a personal moment of reflection. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thank you, Chief. Thank you again for everybody being here. So this year marks the 33rd National Recovery Month, celebrating recovery for every person, every family, and every community, community impacted by the disease of addiction. We come together today to promote evidence-based treatment and recovery practices, support the recovery community, and honor the dedication of service providers who work to improve the lives of those affected by mental health and substance use disorders. We are here to celebrate that people can and do recover every day. I'd like to next introduce Mayor Simison. Prior to serving as the Mayor of Meridian, Robert served as Chief of Staff for 12 years alongside former Mayor Tammy DeVere. It was during that time that he helped advocate for prevention and education and supported the mission of the Meridian Anti-Drug Coalition. He continues to do so as Mayor of Meridian, a husband and a father, Robert knows the importance of substance abuse prevention and continues to support the coalition's mission and our partners in prevention, treatment, and recovery, which we come together to celebrate today. Please welcome Mayor Simison. Thank you, Kendall. Um, Kendall touched on you know, the theme for this month uh, for Solve Recovery. Recovery is for everyone, every person, every family, every community and it really does take a community and when i look at the people that are here today they are a great representative of all the sectors of our community all sectors of our anti-drug coalition that are here to support uh the needs of those in recovery it's it's we we all know well, many of us have a family member a friend who's been impacted by substance abuse and we know that one person generally cannot go through this alone. It, it, it takes a strong network. You know, it's great that we're, we're having a, a growing network of companies come to Meridian that can help provide support. Uh, we were at a, at a ribbon cutting for North Point Recovery uh, last, week, two, last week. Uh, we, we just go by fast these days. Um, but to have, you know, I know that they would prefer not to be in business. 
but it's a necessary business, you know, to, to help those as part of their step and as part of the process. Um, it's also great to have pe people like 10 Mile Christian, and, and we have Bethine here who worked alongside Pastor Moore for 50 years, and, and recovery is a huge part of what they offer um, through their uh, through their church and through their members. And I think it really ties in well with our speaker today. If you go through and look at the history of what where they've been and where they're going as, as a as a faith family there. So I'm glad that the, this, this has been an important part of what the city of Meridian is all about. Um, they say, I think this is my, I've been, it's here my 15th or 16th recovery breakfast that I've been to of the 17 that have been done here. Um, and, and it's always important to, to show up, to hear the stories, to understand, um, so that more people can be part of the conversation. I want to, so I want to first say thank you to all the people who are part of MADC, who, who show up at the meetings, who go to the events, uh, who go out into the schools, who work together uh, to, to help provide the resources necessary to the, to the community. Um, and that's really under the leadership of Kendall, uh, as well as go up the line all the way to the chief. Uh, we know that there's strong support within the police department and all the way to the city council for the efforts of what uh, MADC does here in the community. While we, while we do what we can, it also is important that we have community partners. And just like to mention the St. Louis Community Health donated $1,500 recently to MADC. You know, it helps make things like this possible for the community to come out and participate. So just want to say thank you to them. So with that, uh, we're not here to hear me talk. So uh, I get have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Stephanie, who I got to meet a little bit this morning. We, you know, and... Uh, we were able to connect about the wind in the other part of the state over in Eastern Idaho. But uh, Stephanie Taylor Thompson is a field director for a prison fellowship. She oversees all prison fellowship programs for Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. She is in long-term recovery and a formerly incarcerated person. Stephanie earned full pardons from both Idaho and Montana in 2017. She graduated from Idaho State University with degrees in sociology and criminology and is currently pursuing her master's in social work at Northwest Nazarene University. Stephanie is a former reentry specialist for the Idaho Department of Correction. She is also a certified peer support specialist, certified family support partner and recovery coach. Stephanie is an elected board member for the Greater Idaho Falls City Police Foundation, Center for Hope, and several others, as well as a council member for the Idaho State Rehabilitation Council. Stephanie has received state and national awards for her work on reentry and criminal justice reform. She is passionate about corrections, criminal justice, reentry, recovery, suicide prevention, and anti human trafficking efforts. Uh, please join me in welcoming Stephanie uh, to hear her story of recovery journey. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for, thank you, Kendall. Thank you, Mayor and Chief, for the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, Recovery Month, what a great month to celebrate. Um, it is so nice to see all the celebrations, not only in our state and local communities, but across the country. It proves um, over and over that recovery is possible. We need to be celebrating it, not just every month, but every day recovery needs to be celebrated every day. I am a face of recovery, just like so many millions of Americans across our country. I like to introduce myself. I'm Stephanie Taylor Thompson. I'm a person in long-term recovery. And for me, that looks like I have not abused methamphetamine or cocaine since May 23rd of 2010. I am also a survivor. I'm a formerly incarcerated person, a restored citizen, I'm also a survivor of human trafficking, sexual assault, a gang rape that nearly ended my life, an attempted murder, and icing on the cake, thyroid cancer. So I have been through quite a bit. Like many people that start their pathway into addiction, um, you know, none of us ever grow up thinking that we're going to lead a life in addiction or incarceration. Um, 
We come from, a lot of us come from troubled pasts. We come from broken families and are really just trying to find ways to, to numb traumas and pain that we've been through. And ultimately, they're, they're co it's a coping mechanism. It's a disease. There are times I can recall growing up, um, my father struggled severely with an addiction to alcohol, as well as um, untreated bipolar disorder. My mother struggled with depression, uh, as well as uh, an aggressive form of multiple sclerosis back when I was 12 years old. There wasn't a lot of treatment for that, and we thought numerous times that we were going to lose my mother. So, um, you know, a lot of uncertainty in my family. We, we walked on eggshells. There are times I can recall my father storming our home in an alcohol-induced rage with a rifle in his hand, um, threatening to end his life. So my younger sister and I spent a lot of time hiding in my bedroom closet. Um, I was sexually abused as a child along with my younger sister and shortly after that had developed an eating disorder to cope with the body images that I was struggling with and really the pain that I was going through. Um, I was ashamed. I didn't feel like I could talk to anyone or open up to anyone and I really didn't want to hurt my parents talking about this. I, I didn't know how to cope with that information so that was my first pathway into addiction was a food addiction and um, eventually led me down to something which was, I thought at the time, very innocent, marijuana and alcohol. And it's, it's no surprise, many of the people that I've worked with and coached throughout the year or uh, clients that I have helped supported through their reentry and recovery, it starts with something so innocent as alcohol and marijuana. And that's why key prevention programs are so important throughout our Idaho communities. Um, my, my substance abuse with alcohol and marijuana introduced me to a group of people that were much older than me, had absolutely no business being around me, and were involved in some things that were way over my head. Um, I came from a very, you know, pretty conservative background, had no idea what I was getting myself into. And that is how I met my human trafficker. My trafficker was 18 years older than me. I met him as a young teenager. And that is how, once again, the grooming process started with me. He was trafficking marijuana, and that's all I thought that was going on, and it was much, much more. Unbeknownst to me, he was one of the largest gang members in Southern California and had the entire drug trade in Idaho and the, the Pacific Northwest controlled. So um, really had no idea the amount of danger that I was putting myself in. And I've seen this with so many others too. Um, I started uh, trafficking drugs for him uh, from Southern California all the way across Idaho and Utah and Montana. And, you know, didn't, I, I take full responsibility for what I've done. I did not know at the time just how the severity of the things that I was involved in, um, you know, Many people going through high school, they have dreams of going on into college or, or serving our great country. And I had dreams like that. And they were completely crushed because of my drug addiction and the collateral damage that was causing in my life. Instead of going off into college or, or serving in other capacities, I was facing my first drug trafficking charges, two counts, which at that time held a life sentence. 18 years old, facing these charges, my very first time in trouble, I had no idea what to do. I did not have the support that I need, and unfortunately, were, you know, law enforcement that was involved in my life at that time was not recovery-focused, and some were very unethical. I ended up going through those trafficking charges um, and was told you know, do not testify against your trafficker. I didn't even know I was a victim of human trafficking at the time. A lot of people, when they hear that, they automatically think of prostitution. And that's not necessarily the case. A lot of times that looks like drug trafficking. Young women and men, vulnerable people being involved in the drug trafficking tra trade and becoming mules for traffickers. And that's what my story looks like. Um, 
yeah, so going through that and um, having to testify against my trafficker, not wanting to do that, being very scared to do that, and receiving information from him and his friends that if I did do that, um, it would not end up well for me. And they held true to that promise. Um, a year mm -hmm. after my conviction, I was kidnapped from my Idaho Falls apartment, taken to California where I was gang raped, I was stabbed, and I was beaten to the point I was placed into a medically induced coma. Um, a lot of people my age, I'm 39, going on to 40 very soon, uh, they don't have funeral planning done, and I have that done because my poor mother at the time did not think that I was going to survive that attack. So um, I never recovered after that. I was not able to get through that trauma and I decided to go back to the very thing that helped me numb and just zone out my entire life. I continued to abuse drugs, and cocaine and methamphetamine very hard as much as I could um, it ended up with stents back in jail. I can't even recall how many charges I've had, the arrests, um, and times throughout treatment, 14 different rehabs. I never stayed at any of them for more than a week. Um, I eventually ended up on felony supervision again in Idaho. And while I had a wonderful probation officer, she tried very hard to build a rapport with me and try to help me, get me back into treatment, I didn't trust her and I didn't give her the opportunity to support me. So again, I took off, I absconded and did what I felt was best for me, continued using, continued this path of destruction that was literally putting me into a grave. I ended up absconding to Montana uh, where I was charged with another felony drug possession. Um, I really should have been charged with federal charges had it not been for a very ethical law enforcement officer who I am so proud to call one of my closest friends and mentors now. Um, he really stepped in and saved my life. He took an interest in me and saw that I wasn't just a drug addict. I wasn't just a drug trafficker. I wasn't just a criminal, a convict. I was somebody who needed support I was somebody who was amenable to treatment and I could potentially have a life of recovery and be successful. I will never forget the pep talk that I received from him. It still gets me so emotional thinking about this. But Dan really was the first person in law enforcement, um, besides one other officer in Idaho Falls, that really taught me that it was okay to trust law enforcement and put all of my put all of my trust in them and that they were there to protect and serve. So I thank Dan O'Malley for that so much. He advocated for me for my charges to stay in state instead of going through federal courts. And I received a 10 year sentence in Montana. I'm incredibly blessed that I received that sentence. And I thank that judge every day for the sentence that I received there. Um, I was required to come back to Idaho to face my, my uh, warrant that I had in Idaho. So our, our wonderful governor at the time, Governor Otter, had signed a warrant for me to come back home. Um, so I made my way back to Idaho where I was, um, I was put back before my judge. And I kept hearing the same thing over and over for some reason. God was just working in a certain way in my life and... Um, giving me these wake up calls, putting the right people in my life at the right time. I'd gone back before my judge, Judge Schinderling, and he asked me the same question that Dan had asked me. How, many, how much treatment have you had in your life, Stephanie? What have you done to get help? Jail doesn't count. You don't get help when you're in jail. That's not a place for you to recover. I said, well, I've been through 14 different rehabs. And he said, how, many, how long did you stay for them? Were they successful? No, I stayed for about a week at a time with, with any of them. I didn't care any uh, time anybody in those treatment programs started asking anything uncomfortable, I was out of there. So Judge Genderling said, this time you are going to go to a treatment program. It's going to go and be in a prison and you won't be able to leave. So it was one of the best things that have ever happened in my life. A lot of people, you know, they 
They don't really say that prison was a blessing to them or the best thing that ever happened. But for me, it was. That is what my recovery pathway looked like. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful to be a formerly incarcerated person because I am a restored citizen. I'm a restored citizen through Christ with the support of so many people and mentors that I've had in my life. I did excellent when I was in prison. Miss Noons, I'm gonna try not to cry so I can't look at you, but she was a she was an officer when I was in prison at South Boise. And it was women like her, officers that were there to hold you accountable. Once again, phenomenal law enforcement that were there to help hold you accountable, help make sure that the rules will fo were followed, but they were also there and believed in you 100%. We always, me and so many of the other women in that institution, always said, we want to be like Officer Noons when we grow up. We want to get our pretty back. <laughs> <laughs> she is so pretty. Um, but also have that confidence and be able to have a great job while st still caring for people. And there were so many other staff in the prison who were like that. Her and one of my case managers and the warden really just took an interest and made sure that we all knew our worth and that we were we were able to come out of that place a better, better person than what we went in. And I made a promise to myself. It's the first time I ever started believing in myself and really turned my life over to Christ. I started believing in something much bigger than me. I will never forget the day that I prayed. I prayed to God for the first time, even after everything that I'd been through, this is the first time that I really had prayed and decided to turn my life over to our Lord and Savior. I said, God, if you can please, I keep hearing this from all these wonderful staff and these people that you've put in my life. If I can please go through this tumultuous environment this time and I can come out a better person than what I came in, I will spend the rest of my life serving you. And that is exactly what I have done. I've held to that promise every single day. I'm thankful for the relationship that I have with Christ. And that is what I hold on to so dearly. That is also another one of my recovery pathways. I did phenomenal when I was in prison so much that I was able to come back out on supervision. I excelled in my supervision. I finally came out and I trusted my PO. She did not want me back on her caseload at first, but she took a chance on me. And I promised her too. I said, if you will take a second chance on me, I, I won't let you down. I've changed. I have a new mindset. I want recovery this time. I want to come out and I want to re-enter successfully. I did everything I could to have a successful supervision. I got myself into treatment and I was so blessed to find a therapist that I could work with. And the key with her was not only was she so, such a strong advocate for recovery and reentry, but she was trauma informed. It's the first therapist that I had had in my life that was able to help me identify that I had been a victim of human trafficking. I didn't know that being sold to cover up somebody's drug debt, that was a form too of human trafficking. I didn't quite understand everything that I had been through, and Jana helped me go through all of that. She saw me for two years pro bono, like for free. I had ran out of funding very quickly. 12 years ago, it's crazy to think it's been that long, but 12 years ago, we didn't have the same opportunities for treatment and funding for treatment that we did but that we do now. I ran out of funding very quick and she saw that a month and a half with me was not going to be sufficient. It needed to be much longer. So Jana helped me work. We, I, I met with her one to two times a week for two years and we worked through some very hard things. During this time going through treatment, I, I decided that, you know, I looked back at people like Officer Noons and the warden and my case manager and this, these phenomenal law enforcement that I had in my life, both of my POs. I had two POs going through supervision. Sarah had to let me off of her caseload because she cared too much about me. We're best friends now. <laughs> um, 
you know, my second PO2, I looked at these women, these strong women and men and said, you know what, I want to do this someday. I want to go into law enforcement. I want to give back and I want to help people recover just like you helped me recover. I want to be a strong advocate for law enforcement because that's what helped me put my life back together. And so I did just that. I enrolled in Idaho State University. Um, started out, I have, a, I have a head injury. I have a severe head injury. Um, started out at, you know, remedial classes. I started out at a sixth grade level with English and math and was told numerous times that, you know, unfortunately by some educators, they didn't think that I was going to make it. But I always held on to my POs and them telling me, you know what, we're going to get you through this. What can we do? They found me mentors. They found me tutors. They found me an AmeriCorps VISTA that was in our office. And Denise tutored me for a year in math. I won't ever forget going in there, her, me being tutored for math for the first time. She's like, okay, um, you know, we're looking at uh, fractions and, and integers and everything. And she's like, what do you know about math? And I, you know, we laugh, we laugh hysterically about this now, but I just told her, I know weights and measurements and that's about it. <laughs> but she worked with that. And Denise, Denise helped me get through, um, she helped me get through college, was able to graduate with honors, um, proudly with honors. Uh, I joined Mortar Board, was the president with Mortar Board for a short time in ISU. And, um, I'm so thankful for my degrees in sociology and criminology. I have decided to further my education and am now a student at Northwest Nazarene University pursuing my master's in social work. Um, and I plan to never, never quit learning. Education has been a huge pathway for me. It's, you know, like Mayor said, everybody's recovery pathway looks different and we just have to help people find that recovery pathway. We don't need to be a voice for them. They already have a voice. We just need to work together to help elevate it and give them the support that they need. Everybody is amendable to treatment. Everybody is able to recover if we can just work together and support them. I continued being mentored by these phenomenal men and women in my life. One of them was our former director of the Idaho Department of Correction, Kevin Kemp, and then Henry Atencio, and now Josh T. Wall. Um, I had decided I, I wanted to, I wanted to go back and work in corrections, which was unheard of with a person with a background like mine. But I decided, you know, prayed about it, and God's telling me, just go meet with the director, Stephanie, and see what he says. So I drove up from Idaho Falls to Boise and out, I sat outside of his office until I could get a meeting with him. <laughs> totally intimidated. I'm like, I cannot believe you're here with the director, but I wanted to show him what my, what my ideas were like, what my strategies, what I wanted to do for the department, and most importantly, serve those that are incarcerated on supervision. So he's the first person who took a chance on me, said, you know what, I'm, I believe in you. I'm not so much looking at what's happened in your life, but what you're doing now. So Director Kemp, he offered me an internship with the Department of Correction. I completed that internship and worked alongside the phenomenal program manager, Jeff Kirkman. And together we helped build a, a mentor program, a statewide uh, mentoring program called Free to Succeed. Have any of you heard of it? Yeah. It's a phenomenal program. I absolutely love Free to Succeed. So I poured my heart and soul to, into that. I was so thankful for my internship. I later on was able to be help, uh, hired as a contractor through AmeriCorps. Um, I loved my time with AmeriCorps. Um, I thought back to, you know, Denise, my the VISTA in our office, and how she helped me get through college. I wanted to be that person too, that was able to help somebody get through a really hard time and succeed. I did so well with AmeriCorps that I was so humbled to be honored um, and recognized with a National Excellence in Service Award in Washington, D.C. by our own Congressman, Mike Simpson. Um, very hard for me to talk about awards and stuff because I'm a humble person. So, um, but that's really was very a wonderful time in my life. Um, I decided, you know, I was really, I was really tired of having my past come up and help me holding me back from opportunities and um 
decided I wanted to try and do what I could to put my past behind me. That's another thing we need to look at is people's histories. You know, you you can't erase history. I, I'm not a supporter of that. It happened. We should be able to move on from it, though. You should not have to wear this metaphorical scarlet letter for the rest of your life. And that's what I wanted to see if I could get past that. I decided that I wanted to apply for pardons in both Idaho and Montana. I had reached out to attorneys in both states and was told it would cost anywhere up with $50,000. And I was also told that there's, there's no way it's possible with someone with a background like yours. Good luck. So I decided to do them myself. I researched Idaho statute, Montana statute, um, and immersed myself in anything I could for a year and a half. I went through that. And I am so thankful to God and to both governors um, in Idaho and Montana. I was granted a full pardon in Idaho in July of 2017 and another full pardon in December of 2017. Not easy to get. I now devote my time, volunteer my time to help ensure others have that opportunity as well. Um, I do this for free. Um, it's something that I'm very passionate about because I want to see others be able to have that opportunity to move forward and see if they can put their past behind them too. It's not perfect. We still need reform in Idaho. Um, it's crazy that, you know, two full pardons and I still cannot pass a background check. So there's some work that needs to be done there. But, um, you know, going through working as a VISTA, successfully completing that, I decided my time with corrections wasn't done and went on to work as a reentry specialist for the Idaho Department of Correction in the same office that I was supervised for many years and was so honored to be able to serve countless men and women coming out of our Idaho institutions and helping them find their recovery and reentry pathway. During this time here, um, I just, it, it also came up numerous times asking, you know, building a rapport with my clients and seeing just how they got to the spot that they were in, what led them to prison. And so many times it was something they thought was so innocent too, starting to use marijuana, starting to use alcohol it leads to worse things. I wish that more people could understand this. Um, and I, I've, I've seen it firsthand, reading PSIs, talking to people. It all starts out with a simple drug use, like using marijuana, using alcohol, and then they're introduced to harder things. And now they're in prison. They've completely, you know, they've been on a path of, to of destruction. So prevention is so key. I am so thankful for um, organizations such as the Meridian Anti-Drug Coalition and former organizations such as the Idaho Meth Project. I was a volunteer for the Idaho Meth Project for numerous years. We need prevention programs like that back. And we need to continue working together to ensure that not only are we supporting those in recovery and reentry and making sure that access to recovery and, and reentry are affordable, they're accessible, but making sure that we are placing as much emphasis on prevention. Because if we can do that, then we're not having to deal with stuff on the back end. I love now that the people that I have mentored and coached, they are the biggest keys to prevention. They go back to their kids and their families and their communities. They go back into the schools and serve with me and tell our students our most precious asset that we have in our state telling them please do not pick up drugs this is what it has done to my life and we love you we don't want to see the same thing happen for you so with that being said recovery is possible prevention is key um it's never 12 years ago i never thought that i would be where i am today it's i it is an absolute godsend it's a blessing that i am still alive um i live my life in faith now i am a person of faith and i i do everything in prayer and in faith um I was recently called, I had volunteered for Prison Fellowship. We are the nation's largest prison ministry. I volunteered for them in 2016, teaching a reentry class called Anticipate. I loved my time as a Prison Fellowship volunteer, being able to introduce, you know, 
not only again helping others find their reentry and recovery pathway, but also seeing helping them discover that there was redemption and restoration in Christ. I was called again. I call God my manager. I was called by my manager in April <laughs> of you know this year, December. I kept getting a feeling like there's going to be some changes in your life, but April, that's when a call came from a uh, prison fellowship leadership, and they asked me if I'd be interested in a director position with them. So I'm now a director for Prison Fellowship. Um, love the work that we do. It's an absolute honor to be able to, to serve these great states and, you know, once again, ensuring that men and women, they know that recovery is possible. They know that successful reentry is possible. And above everything, they know that there is redemption and restoration in Christ and that they are children of God. Um, I can't thank you all enough for the support and the work that you do and our community and our beautiful state. It is because of people like you that people like me were able to recover. Thank you. So thank you again for sharing your story um, to inspire us and to share with us the impact that we can all have to support each other in our community. Um, it takes courage, um, humility, and uh, vulnerability to do that. So we appreciate that very much. Um, we'd, we'd like to see if there's any questions. Uh, did we get any questions online? No, okay. Anyone in the room have any questions for Stephanie? At all. Yeah. So I've got two kids. What's what's advice for parents to support and love, but also your line about recovery being possible and prevention is key. It really resonated with this. So advice, suggestion, we need to love our kids, but also really reinforce the preventive assessment. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Councilman Kavner. I think that you know the best thing that we can do, and this is something that I really practice going back into our Idaho schools. I, I've gone back in numerous years back into my, my own high school, Skyline High School, just having an honest conversation with them. Um, I, I raised my 13-year-old nephew now. My younger sister died by suicide, unfortunately, after an introduction to drugs, and it completely destroyed her life. Um, I'm very honest with the youth that I mentor now. And my and my family I had a stepson and I have a, a you know 14 year old stepson and a 13 year old nephew, and I teach them that just how dangerous drugs are. I I don't hold my past; it's not a secret. They know everything about my past, um, and just really you know we have wonderful programs like Dare, but really there are there is nobody better than people with lived experience reach into that and tap into those people and have your kids talk to them. You know, what were drugs like? What did they do to your life? Um, you know, it's not a scare tactic. We're just having an honest conversation. Um, I always say that, you know, lived experience, you can't buy it. It's not something that you can, you know, learn in a school or a class. It's not a CEU. You have to have it. So they are the experts in it have that honest conversation or reach out to those that are in recovery or re-entering back from our Idaho institutions and just keep ensuring that we are advocating for strong prevention efforts in our state. Great leadership like you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you again. And I'd like to um, introduce Haley. Haley Blog is the new um, anti-drug coalition coordinator with the Meridian Police Department and works beside us in the prevention unit. And she has some thank yous to share. Okay, so I'd first like to say thank you to Stephanie for sharing your journey and your courage and perseverance. It's amazing, your story. And to Mayor Simison, Chief Basarachia, city council members for your dedicated support. Also to La Peep, Walmart, Human Bean, and Dutch Bros for filling our bellies this morning, the wonderful breakfast. And then also our, par our partners at North Point Recovery, AM, FM, Healthcare for sharing resources and helping promote this special event. Please check out their tables. 
Also to our dedicated MADC volunteers uh, for always supporting us and self setting up help and providing that for us. To all of you making the time to be here, I know it's an early event. We so appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. And then just um, a final couple announcements before we wrap up and encourage you to mingle and finish breakfast if you didn't and maybe another cup of coffee. Um, so on the back table, hopefully you've all signed in joining us today. And we also have a few copies of our education and prevention report, the annual report that comes out that shares um, information about the school resource officer team, the crime prevention unit, and the drug prevention unit, and the prevention that we do in the community. It's a more in-depth look at that. Uh, those are available for you. And to give a little bit of perspective, we, uh, it, as a total, had reached out and done over 504 events and reached 43,000 community members with our prevention and education. And um, MADC was able to do 63 of those events, reaching 26,000 people. So that, that encourages us and keeps us moving forward. Um, it's events like these, it's coming together, it's all the partners uh, that keep us motivated and moving forward when sometimes it can be hard in prevention. And um, with some of the changes in our culture and changes in policy, it can seem like maybe we're not making a difference, but I guarantee that we are and that we need to keep, keep up the good work. Uh, in addition, we have the um, prescription take back event coming up. There's some flyers back there on the table. If you'd like to get more of our updates and hear more about the work that we're doing, we'd encourage you to sign up to receive our twice monthly emails. Um, and you're always welcome to join us at our coalition meetings that are held the third Thursday of the month. They're open to the public. And um, joining in any way, shape, or form is always encouraged, even if it's just information that speaks to you um, and, and it goes no further than that, that's okay. I don't like to have people feel pressured to join in and can commit more of their time and efforts, but if it speaks to you and you'd like to be a part of it, we would love to have you. So I thank everybody for coming today. And the final thing that we have is we have a raffle for the Dutch Bros gift box that was offered up and Haley's gonna wrap that up. <laughs> Everyone have their tickets ready? Okay. Seven, seven, eight, four, one, four. Oh my gosh, you're so Thank you everybody for coming. We appreciate it. And I request that you go forward out into the community and share what spoke to you today so we can spread this conversation. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you.